All right, let's go into our teaching. Now, let me tell you about this teaching, what we are trying to do with Kerry, uh, what we are here in Alabama this time. Number one, we are here because of an open door through these amazing pastors. Put your hands together for them. Amen. I have, I have, I have, uh, I'm a, you know, this is being live streamed. Okay. Lisa, you know how much I love you. I'm about to get in trouble for you. I have several Lisas in my life now, but I love this Lisa right here. Amen. Amen. She's claimed the top number one spot. <laughs> you know, I, we just thank God for you. You are really a class act in the kingdom, both of you. Thank you so much. You know, uh, it's one thing to fight devils, but it's, it's, it's crazy when you have to fight the horse pastor. And we've been to some places where you're like, are you sure you invited me? Because <laughs> you are fighting the devil and the horse pastor, man. It's like God, you know. But when you come to a place like this, it's beautiful to be in a place like that. Amen. So while we are here, and then I'm going to give you something here. Um, I want to, we are here because we hope that there will be a hunger. That there will be a hunger that will rise inside of you to understand more of what we are talking about. Not only to understand more of what we are talking about, but to become it. To become a minister, an effective minister of the gospel. Through the dispensation of grace God has given to me and Katie Souza on what I believe is absolutely the most important subject the Bible has to tell. You know, that ever since the fall of Adam, the obsession of mankind is idolatry. Even the best of us, at at whatever highest levels of faith, the thing that Idols Right has done for me is brought me to, to terms. It brought me to a place where I could, without being ashamed, accept the fact that as powerful as I am, as many books I've written, as, as much as I love Jesus, I do have some idols. See, now, you know, you must understand something. The enemy has done a masterful job of making us ashamed to acknowledge we have idols. The problem is you cannot be delivered from what you refuse to acknowledge. So what you refuse to acknowledge remains hidden in darkness while those things eat you alive. And yet you're not supposed to tell that you've got idols that are rioting in your soul because what would that make you look like? In a church where everybody fights to look really good when they are dying inside. So you end up with a church of people who are dying. Everybody's dying on the bus, but nobody can say it. Because somehow the enemy has managed to convince us that, you know, admitting you have an idol is synonymous with saying you don't love Jesus. That's how it used to feel like to me. Whenever the sort of idolatry would be spoken, I would be squirming in my seat because a part of me felt convicted that I had some idolatry in my life, but the acknowledgement of that terrified me because of what I thought its implications meant. I may not, I may not love Jesus, or I may not be as saved as I was. So when, so when idols riot comes into play, God, the first thing God did was bust that bubble, and boy, the relief that came through that floodgates. The relief and the deliverance, the healing that has come out of knowing I can talk to Jesus about the idols that are in my life that is known about all along. Now for the first time, I get to tell them I'm addicted to this. I actually think this is higher than you right now. But, but, but I'm surprised that you love me through it because you've been still using me in spite of that knowledge. Your idolatry does not surprise Jesus. When you discover it, he knew it before you discovered it. And every testimony you can think about where God showed you grace, loved you through it, he was loving you through your idols. So why are you trying to hide something from somebody who's already known about it before you did? This has been the genius of the devil to allow us to believe. If we can hide it from ourselves, maybe we hide it from Jesus too. That's a lie. You see what I'm saying? So what it did for us and it's doing for people, I'm having people said, this is the first time I can go in a church service and I find a bunch of people talk, talk, talking to each other, I have idols, oh, I have idols too, I have idols. Whoa! <laughs> what? <laughs> you should have been in Nashville. Nashville. Lunch hour was funny. 
You know, lunch, I was funny. You know, I mean, people didn't know me here. I was hearing behind them as they are fellowshipping. They are, where are you going to find a charismatic church where people own it? They are eating, they are talking, they are saying like, man, you know what? I've got five idols. I just saw with the five idols. Oh, yeah, i got six. You know, the Lord showed me on the street. And I'm like, and I'm like, Lord, what is this? He says, my children are getting cleaned out. They're getting cleaned out. Because every other place, people hide them. People hide them. She, if demons had their way with men, it is they would love to put us under a gag of silence. Because they work better when we keep quiet. That's why they tell Jesus, leave us alone, because they like to hide in the shadows. Demons are masters of shadows. They do better. That's why, God, that, that's why in the Lord there's no shadow of turning. There's no shadow. In him is full light. And you found out what the light can do yesterday. By the way, tonight there's going to be a hill of healing. Of, so for those who are live streaming, it's good to live stream. But if you want to become a minister with one of us, you really have to show up in a live meeting. Because we want to know who we're training, not just virtually. We've got to be able to meet you, lay hands on you, and then bring you in. Amen? I'm teaching, by the way. I'm already in my flow, okay? So now, Jessica, do you have the... I, I want to talk to you very quickly, in very quickly, on the 12 laws of an altar. 12 laws of what? The reason you need to understand is because then you're going to understand the idols teaching very well. Okay? Amen? Someone said, the devil is looking for a dynasty. Say, the devil is looking for a dynasty. Now say this, not in my life. Do you know that God raises a deliverer for every family? God raises a deliverer for what? Every family. This is why you have been so different from everybody in your family. The deliverer is always the black sheep. The deliverer is always the one hungry for things nobody in the family wants. Because you are the Moses of the family. The reason you are here today on a, on a meeting called Idols Right Healing and Deliverance Services, you did not understand what it was. You are like, but my God. Amen. Come on, somebody. But you still came. Something inside of you knew you are supposed to be here because every family, God raises a Moses. Every family, God raises a deliverer. I'm a deliverer for my family. My family is in walking in freedom, including my father came to Christ because I got born again. You catch what I'm saying? So there's always a Moses. I believe you are here today because you are a deliverer for your bloodline. You are the one who ends the nonsense. You are the one who says the idols and the altars. You are getting out of my family. So help me God. And one after the other, you're going to see your family members. Though, what family, see, here's what happens. When you allow God to make you a deliverer in your family, then you hold the title. See, there's a law in the spirit. Whosoever holds title is the one who has the legal right to fight everything, thing, every demon in your bloodline that has held title until you. So that's why God is raising you up. So that you can send out to every demon, okay, I'm going to check. Before you know your mother is free. Before you know it, your father is free. Before you know your, your sister is free. You see what I'm saying? Because it's you, you, you holding the title. And you are the one going, going through the bloodline and kicking butt. Come on, somebody. And getting devils out. That's what we want out of you. So I want you to uh, 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 look at Genesis 126 very quickly. You know, you know Genesis, we know Genesis 126 very quickly. I just want to give you a couple of scriptures. Um, amen. A couple of scriptures, Genesis 1.26. God said, let us make man in our image. Remember that? You know, and God said, let, let, you know, yeah, now, amen. Let us, let us, let us, okay. Now, now I want to use, let, let, God said, let us, let, let us, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Is that right? Yes. Make what? Mankind in our image after our likeness. Let them have complete authority. I say complete authority. Complete authority means when it comes to authority in the planet earth, God left nothing out on the table, even for himself, it's yours. This is why the lie that God is sovereign is, 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 is God is sovereign, yes, he's sovereign, and yet he's not. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, this is interesting. We have used the sovereignty of God to excuse ourselves from taking responsibility for our complete authority. Let them have complete authority over the fish of the sea, over the beds of the air, the tem, the beasts, over all the... Now, the, I want to look at those words. Ever said, let them. 
If you have a Bible that is physical, you can even cycle it, let them. But those words are powerful. Everybody said, let them. These two words are the most important words God ever spoke on earth. These two words. The most important, absolutely, words God ever spoke to man. Because no words, have, no words changed radically and drastically the relationship between God and man than those two words, let them. Because in letting them, God excludes himself from what he's about to do. If God had said, let them and us, then complete authority would be shared between God and man over the earth. But it's not. God said, let them, male and female. Come on, son, let them. He said, male and female. Come on now. Hello, come on, somebody. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm from Africa. I love a lively, I love a lively crowd. <laughs> Next time I come to I come here, I'll bring some African juice. Everybody who comes in, you have to take a shot. It's not a vaccine, but it's an African juice. When they come in, they go, ah! People are like, ah, what? You are so active today. I've got the African juice, man. <laughs> These two words, let them change everything. <clears throat> God chose to use to ping his sovereignty on those two words. Is God sovereign? Yeah, God is so sovereign, he excluded himself out of complete authority. He chose to use his sovereignty to take himself out. That's why when you say, God is sovereign, he'll move anyway. No, if I'm going to move in any area, then I have to find a man. It could be John, it could be Kerry. But I, you know, every time you ask God, every time Israel cried for God to deliver them, God never came himself. He chose to use his sovereignty to raise another vessel who can say yes. So God never uses his sovereignty to break the law, the law he created. See, we want God to use his sovereignty to break the law. He's not a lawbreaker. He opposes the law. Because the king who breaks the law is not a king worth having. And God is king. And in him there is no lie. If he tells you something, he will not break it to make you feel better. Because you are asking a king to break law. The moment he breaks it for you, he breaks it for everybody else. And he's not a king worth having. So every time you cry for a deliverer, God goes to the book of the law, which is his word. And finds what law applied to how he can fix this issue. And he says, Lord, according to your own law, you said, let them, in the word of men, you give them complete authority. So if you have to do anything to fix whatever they are broken, you have to raise one of them. <laughs> so God takes 40 years to raise Moses because that's how long it took to raise one of them. So for 40 years, they are still slaves because God is taking 40 years to raise one of them. But he's sovereign. When they are being beaten in, in, in Egypt, you, you think don't, don't, God does not see the weeps? He doesn't see the cries of the children of Israel? He sees them, but even in their tears, God will not break the word. He says, I know you think I don't, I'm not hearing right now, but there's a man on the backside of the desert. He's in exile right now. He's, a, he's, a, he's kind of thick in the skull, so it's taking me 40 years to really prepare him. You think God wanted Moses to come into ministry at the age 40, at uh, age 80? He had a thick skull. God had to take 40 years to take Egypt out of him and brought him back at 80 to start his ministry. There's hope for all of you. <laughs> tell somebody, tell somebody, there's hope for you. <laughs> <laughs> the greatest ministry in the Old Testament began at 80. There's hope for all of us. Okay? Let them have complete authority. Let them. Those two words change how God Relates to men. <laughs> it changed how demons and the Satan relate to you. You have more power than you realize. The problem is you have abdicated that power through your passivity and through your religiosity thinking, you know, but you don't understand that both God and the devil desperately need you. Well, God doesn't need me. Yeah, let's say somebody who's doesn't understand God. God says, I, that, you don't read the word. What do you mean God said, I don't need you? I just told you, Ezekiel 22, 30, I looked for a man. <laughs> I looked for a man to do what? Stand in the gap so I don't, so I don't do what? Destroy the land. Who told you? God doesn't need me. Oh, he needs you. Cool. 
One time I said, oh, Lord, you know these things we say, oh, God, you know, you don't need me. God said, shut up, boy, I need you. Just get with the program. <laughs> you think I'm spending all these years trying to change you because I don't need you? Shut up, boy. I need you and real bad. But I'll chase you around town until, I, until one day you say, yes! Because that's how much I need you. Turn to an action and say, God needs you. And, you, and, and then tell them, but you, but you need him a whole lot. So those two words, let them have dominion. Let them have dominion means God delegates the authority of earth to men. Okay? Making by that one statement, earth the word of men. Say with me, earth is the word of men. Okay? What does that mean? Now, now, that becomes what is known as the law of dominion. Let, the law of dominion or the law of territory. Let me write, let me write, I want you to write down the law of dominion. If you can write it down or get it on your, hopefully you can write it down. Or get it in your spirit. Amen. Come on, somebody. And by the way, this is why I love coming to the school. Because when you come in the school, you are not going to just watch me teach. You're going to have a pen writing because that's why I love schools. Because you come not to, to, to be entertained, you come to digest and that's why I love schools. I love schools more than life conferences. Okay? You know, but here's the bottom line. Write this one down. This is the law of dominion. The law of dominion. Okay? In the law of dominion, the law of dominion simply states this. That spirits without bodies, spirits with what? Spirits without bodies are illegal on earth. Spirits without bodies are what? Are illegal on earth. Are what? Are illegal on earth and have no authority on earth. And have what? And have no authority on earth unless they are working through a human being. Did you get the Lord dominion now? That's the Lord dominion. Or it's, or, or it's also called the law of territory. Meaning that ter the earth territory belongs to what? Man. Just like heaven belongs to God. Earth belongs to you. In terms of authority. Not ownership. Ownership is two gods. The earth and the world there belongs to the Lord. It's ownership versus authority. Okay, do, do you get the point? Okay, let me give, give, give you what I mean. Uh, give, give an example. How many, how many have ever rented a house? Okay. Who owns the house? The owner. But why you, the lease is on and you are paying your bills, you are paying the rent, who has authority? Even the landlord cannot come to your house without what? Talking. Are you, did you now catch it? You are living this, you are living the principle. If you are a renter, you are living the principle of how you are, re, you are living out the arrangement between God and man. Earth is mine, but the lease is yours. Earth is mine, but the lease is yours. So if anything, if, if any spirit from the invisible world shows up on your territory, you did it. You can't blame it on God. You did it. If, if come on, somebody, are you catching what I'm saying? What is God saying? He's saying, if, a, if an angel shows up in your house, you did it. If the Holy Ghost shows up in your life, you did it. But if the devil and his mother-in-law show up in your house, you did it. <laughs> Are you catching what I'm saying? This is the law of dominion. So, God makes that the law, but he's locked out. But God is a genius. Are you, are you with me? So, say, so God gives man complete what? Authority, but not power. Say within, but not power. So that's why David says in the book of Psalms, twice, God has spoken it once, but twice ever I heard it. That power belongs to who? God. Why did God do it? Genius. Are you catching what I'm saying? So God gives you complete authority, but he retains the power. And he says, amen, you can have access to my power 
if you give me legal permission to work with you. Are you guys what I'm saying? Are you with me? Why do you think witches are witches? It's God's. Because power remained in the invisible realm. So the devil has power. The witches have authority, but they don't have power. <laughs> so they need to exchange. They need to gamble. They need to trade. They need to trade. So the enemy, the devils want, a, want access to the world of men. The witches want access to the power of the celestial beings. I want, come on, someone, amen. So if you are Kenny Souza, you are Benny Hinn, come on, and you want people to be healed in mass, you realize I don't have power to heal a pinky toe. I don't have power to heal one strand of hair. Are you catching what I'm saying? But I have something I can trade with. I have complete authority in the world of men. And, and God would really want access to through me to other people who need to know him, but he's got the power. If we can just come together, come on somebody, amen, God is looking for legal right to use his power on earth legally. I could be that vessel who allows God, and then all of a sudden, our partnership, hey, I got the authority, he's got the power, and we're working together, bam! <laughs> so watch this now. So God says, so how does God bridge the two worlds, spirit and natural, without violating law? Without vo Remember, when God sets the law, Lucifer has no choice but to obey it. Because God's law is higher law. So Lucifer is a celestial being. See, and, 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 and unlike these stupid teachings that we are getting in the church, because these, these people don't, don't even know what they are talking about, Satan cannot do anything that's not legal. He can't. He has to work around the laws of the kingdom. So, he just figures out, figures them out, and then, you know what's called in, in technology? Reverse engineering. Reverse engineering is when somebody figures out your technology, Reverses engineer it for their own benefit. Are you catching what I'm saying? That's what oh, Satan is just a master reverse engineer. Find that, okay. So, so Satan is, you know, you know, so God creates an interface. Some of that interface. That you know as an, oh, now, this interface, you guys know it as an, the Bible. See, the Bible, uh, uh, see, the Bible, God is, 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 is such a pragmatist. When you're a pragmatist, you reduce your language to the intelligence of the generation you're writing to. If the Bible was written today, there, there would be no way to alter in the Bible. There would be the way the interface. Because we can understand what an interface is. But trust me, somebody coming out of a, a, a cave, <laughs> caveman, you tell him interface, he's like, what? So God had to use something outside of them to symbolize something powerful in the spirit. Alters. So, this thing, so, so watch this now. Are you with me? So, God built an interface. Some of the interface. Between the natural and what? Okay, actually I'm going to use this. Can I use this as an example? Okay. Alright. Because so, this is, that's what an altar is. I'm going to just put this. Okay. So, this, you guys are angels. I just promise you are celestial beings. You are angels. You are. These are just the earthly people, okay? Boo. Boo. <laughs> yes. Come on, somebody. Come on. I need mine. All right. So, this realm of spirit has power. The earth realm has authority. Okay? Are you guys what I'm saying? But the battle is over this territory. Okay? So both God and the angels want to get into the fight. The devil wants to get into the fight, but there's a law that says you cannot because spirits without bodies on earth are illegal unless they have found a human who's willing to come to the table to trade authority for power. And then an agreement is made. That's why you see all these movies. They show you what they do in this Hollywood. They know what they are doing. Yeah. Watch some of even Thor. 
There's always an altar in these movies. Watch the Marvel series. They are showing it right in front of you. Remember Wakanda? He had to go to the land of the dead. Come on. They are telling you what they are transferring. That there's an interface between the, wor the world of Wakanda and the world of the ancestors. Remember the Wakanda? He had to die with this plan and then come back. And the ancestors gave him power. They connect him to the power. <laughs> and then he comes back. Is Where do you think Hollywood gets those ideas from? Because they are doing it in real time. Altars are more basic to man than anything you know. They are as old as the earth itself. Altars. So God says, all right, here's the deal, Adam. You're there. I'm here. You got authority. And I just made a law that made me illegal in your world unless you legally invite me in. You see what I'm saying? This is why fellowship with God is important. Fellowship. Okay? So God says, okay, here's what I'm doing. I'm putting a gate to hold the spirits from this world from crossing into your world. What does God, why did God do it? Because you must understand, when Adam is being created, Lucifer has already fallen. Read your Bible. You were in Eden, the garden of God. He was already fallen. So as a loving heavenly father, number one, he wants a child who can be like him in the world of men, right? God made us kings like him. He's a king. So we're kings in the earth. Am I talking to anybody? Is this good enough? Amen. I'm trying to show you how to release power in your life. Power always comes to an altar. And prayer is how you save is the altar. So prayer without an altar is a waste of time. Because <laughs> you have no gate. So watch this. So God says to Adam, you've got the power. You've got the authority. I've got the power. But I've created a way in which your world and mine can work together. But since, come on somebody. But since it's me trying to come into your world, you have the license. You are the licensing agent. My God. You are the licensing agent. Whatever you license. Oh, Jesus put it this way. Whatever you bind on earth. <laughs> he didn't say whatever God binds. God doesn't bind anything. You bind. God does not lose anything. You lose. Read your Bibles. God doesn't lose anything. If something is lost, God is like, who did it? <laughs> who on earth lose that? Who on earth bound that? Whatever you bind on earth, there will be a reciprocal reaction in heaven. In the world of men. But have you noticed there is no scripture? That gives you the legal right to bind anything in heaven. Because then you are violating the law of territory. Can I repeat that? I'll tell you you are. He said. Jesus said. Whatever you bind. Is that right Pastor John? On earth. And it's very clear. See, God does not... See, what I love about the Lord, He communicates clearly. God hates misunderstandings. There's no being who desires to be understood more than God. So He loves to use simple terms. Not like people like me who use big words. God loves simple terms because He wants His kids to get them. Whatever you bind on earth, so He shows you territories involved. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Heaven will have no choice but to respond. Because when it comes to the earth, the licensing, the complete authority was given to you. But power becomes to come, belongs to us. So if you're in a relationship, if you bind something on earth, we'll back you up with the power we have on the other, our side. That's what he's saying. Our power is a reaction to your decree. 
because we have a licensing agreement between us. Are you catching what I'm saying? This is why all the people that are into witchcraft, they understand this. Are you catching what I'm saying? But, God is a genius. Are you with me so far? I'm, I'm trying to help you understand an altar in, a, in an American way. Am I doing, am, am I helping? <laughs> I'm trying to Americanize the altar. Because in Africa, we'd grow up knowing altars from the time you're a child because you see your fathers and bowing down to them and offering the priest, our, our so-called priest offering their chicken. I mean, we grew up. So for us, understanding altars is easy because, and the people in South America too, people in Mexico, it's true because they also got the same type of cultures, so they get it. It's in the American West, you really have to explain it because the altars here are sophisticated, they hide. So we have to expose them and then say, oh my God, that's that, that's that, that's that, that. So what I was saying, sister, was this. He said, this is why you don't find a place in the Bible where a man is ever allowed to bind anything in heaven. Because you are violating the law of territory. Heaven is not yours. The, the, earth, the Bible even tells us, Psalm 115 verse 16, the heavens of heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth he has given to the children of men. So an altar, God says, this thing, this interface, this connective tissue, the gate between your world, our world of spirit, with your world of flesh, is going to be governed by an altar, a platform. And because it's your world that we are coming into, a man must attend to the altar. You catch what I'm saying? And that's what the altar is. It's simply a gate between the word of men and the word of spirit. I get what I'm saying. So this is why, this is why, uh, come on somebody, this is why when, when you're talking about, when, when Katie says last night, idols are nothing but what? Demon spirits. Since they are spirit, they are affected by the law of territory. <laughs> they are spirits without bodies. So, they need yours. <laughs> they need yours <clears throat> to be legal on earth. But in order for them to have a dynasty, a perpetual industry, they have to make sure the gate doesn't, that doesn't close. We are here to close the gates in your bloodline. Because if the gates close, the dynasty ends. If the gate closed, the demonic dynasty ends. That's why idols riot when we come into town. Because they are terrified because they know the gate's about to be closed. Yeah. And all of a sudden, the access that, 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 that spirit of suicide had to your bloodline will be closed. And all of a sudden, members of your family, you don't even know what you, what you did as the deliverer of the family. One day, wake up and say, I don't know what it is, but today I feel different. I've been, oh, I'm always feeling depressed, feel like killing myself. All those thoughts are gone. The gate has been closed. And so they are feeling different. Because the truth, the truth is, they did not want to kill themselves, but every spirit... Now, oh God. I'm trying to use an I'm, 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 I'm Americanizing this message. I'm trying to make. But are you getting it so far? Give me, uh, give me uh, Genesis eight. Let me just look at my show. My time is good. Genesis eight. Put it on the board. Genesis eight twenty to twenty one. Am I doing good, honey? Very good. Hallelujah. Someone say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Halle no, hallelujah. That's African for you. Hallelujah. Sounds more powerful. Hallelujah. Okay. Are you there? Look at this. Genesis 8, 20 to 22. Watch this. As a matter of fact, let's read it together as a count of three, as loud as you can. Can we read it together? Can we do that? Because I want it to get in your spirit. One, two, three, read. 
Then Noah built an altar to the Lord, and there sacrificed burnt offerings, the animals. Verse, next verse. And the Lord was pleased. I will never again curse the ground because of the human race, even though everything they think or imagine is bent toward evil from childhood. I will never again destroy all living things. All living what? All living what? Things. Now, let, now, now, now look at the next verse. What did they read? As long as the earth remains, there will be planting and harvesting, corn and harvest, summer and winter, day and what? Night. Okay, just end on there. Remember, where is God saying this on? Where is God say- See, that scripture was not spoken in the air. If you read it from the Bible, if you don't understand authors, he didn't speak it from the air because he could not. He spoke it on the interface. What is he trying to say? While the earth remains, harvest both seed, seed time and harvest time, seasons of course, every season while the earth remains will be controlled by men like Noah who built altars. Okay. I'll get it again. Do you get what I just, what I just said to you? <laughs> He's saying, while the earth remains. It's not about seed time and harvest time. This is why, uh, 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 this is what the problem with the prosperity movement. They taught that scripture without, out of context. Seed time and harvest time. And they talk about seed. So seed became everything until it was not. People were frustrated. I've sown my seed. Why is, why is there, why am I not getting my harvest? Where is the altar that controls that harvest? Because that was the reaction of God to an altar. What did Noah build? What did Noah build? And God was reacting to what? To the altar. He's saying, watch what a, how powerful this gate, this altar is. If it's this powerful with God, you better believe it's that powerful with the devil. No wonder the devil craves human beings to build altars to him. Because if an altar can change the mind of God... If an altar can make God say, oh, I'll change my mind. Never again. He starts vowing. Notice, there is no prayer involved. No one ever prayed, never asked anything of God. Which brings us to something else. Is, why? Watch this. Noah doesn't, there's no recorded prayer. That he ever prayed. And I said, God, but God, Why? And why did you speak that way? He said to me, that's the voice Noah's altar was making. He didn't have to make it with his mouth. Remember, he made the altar just after he came out of the flood and saw the devastation the flood had done. What do you think he came out to? Bad is running everywhere. I don't care who you are, unless you are, you're, unless you you are, you are heartless, you are heartless Nephilim, which was Noah was not. When you see millions of people lying on the body uh, uh, and ravens feeding over people's flesh, it's gonna break your heart. He saw the severity of God, and he said, "Lord, never again. Don't ever do this again. I know. Oh my God, is there another way for you to do your work without this?" And he built an altar. And the altar was speaking what was in Noah's heart, and God says, "Okay, I hear you. I hear you. Never again." Will I ever do this again? Because Noah was looking at it. Never again will I ever do this again. And Noah, let me tell you something else. From now onwards, seed time and harvest time will be controlled by men and women on earth who build altars. You, you want to change what you are harvesting in your family, build a new altar. You tired of the depression? Build an order to God that will swallow the depression and the harvesting will change because the earth is now controlled by men who build altars. Trust me, the witchcraft people know it better than the church. The church is always lagging behind the demonic world. They'll know it. Why do you think masons? Trust me, masons know that.
he built an altar. Why? Why? Think about this. This guy has come out of 150 years of the flood, 50 days. It's been raining. Why in God's name that the first thing Noah does is not build a house? You think that's the first place you start? You just come out of or do something. The first thing he does is the most important because he now understands how God works. He comes and he builds an altar. Why did he build an altar? To negotiate with God. You can never do this again. And why did God respond to him? Because complete authority over earth was given to what? So when the man said, okay God, I'm glad my family and I survived this, but never again. God heard the man at an altar say, never again. And God echoed the cry of a man, never again. If it's happening in your family, you are the only one who has the power to say, never again. Not on my watch. And God says, okay, not on your watch. Nobody, nobody in my family will ever die young ever again. Not on my watch. And God says, okay, you get, you, this is exciting. What are you going to do about it? I'm going to build an altar to God. Come on, someone, and I, I'm, I'm willing to put the sacrifice on it. It will take to make sure nobody in my family. Remember, whatever you ask God on an altar will cost you. Because an altar is a, an exchange, like Wall Street. <laughs> God, God hears you pray. So you know what prayers prayers are. Is you telling God what you are willing to pay for? <laughs> That's all praise. Telling God, God, I want the blind to be healed. I'm tired of blame. And God says, "Is that Gabriel? Come here, Gabriel. Maybe they're asking the the, uh, the eye angel who controls all the eyeballs in heaven. Come here, come here. Because there's purpose for everything. How much do eyes cost? <laughs> why? Why are you asking, Lord? My daughter." I, wants to have a lot of eye miracles. We need to find what price he has to pay on the altar for us to give her eyeballs all her life. Because an altar is a place of exchange. That's why they sacrifice at altars. Why? Because the sacrifice was the payment for what was in the spirit world. That's why some of you want God to give you a, make you a multi-millionaire, but every time you come to give an offering, it's your $10. He cannot buy that lifestyle in the other world. God says, you, you, you keep coming up short. You keep bringing to the altar. What, that's why God will say, if I am a father, it tells in Malachi, if I am your father, if I am your uh, God, where is my honor? I don't care what you say. I look at what comes on the altar. He says, you bring on the altar blemished, blemished animals, animals you only give to your governor and you sacrifice them to me and you think I can exchange them for power, you are fools. That's what he's saying. If you understand altars, you understand every complaint of God in the Bible. It's like, I don't care what you say. That's why I say, your lips move, but your hearts are far from me. Because I don't investigate your heart by your mouth. I investigate your heart by what's on the altar. Because that's what's real. You give your television seven hours of a day of, of watching it, you give me seven minutes. That's all that's on the altar. Oh, Lord, I love you. No, you love me for seven minutes. Because I don't care what you say, I'm listening to the altar because altars speak. And every altar speaks. The altar, every altar is marked by the sacrifice of the attendant. God can come, even demons. That's what, what you think in the witchcraft realm. The devil keeps asking for more sacrifices from witches who want to have more power. And Hollywood is showing you in movies. What do you think the conjuring? All these movies, they are, they are showing you what they are doing. What do you think COVID was about? It's these globalist cabal who are into witchcraft, witchcraft, trying to have the next level of dominion on earth, and suddenly saying, I need more blood. And they yeah. came up with a virus to give him more blood. Yeah. 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 Everything is about altars. Have you noticed how some people who, 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 head, who head the church, they will censor the church, have become billionaires through COVID because that blood sacrifice was theirs, not yours. So your voice has been masked, muffled, silenced, and theirs is more powerful because they are, they, are, they are put on that altar, blood that is speaking, a high sacrifice, and God is saying, what, what are you going to put on mine to counteract the COVID sacrifice? Well, you know, you're still, you're five minutes a day, you're ten minutes a day, or oh, that, that, that won't deal with what the, that won't even come close to touching the kind of power these guys now have. 
because they've given to the devil everything he needed on his altar. His altar is filled with the blood of men. They were willing to, they were willing to, they were willing to become animals, kill people for more power. They knew what they were doing. They knew it came from a lab. They knew they invented it. They knew all this was a lie. But if this is what it costs for the devil to give them more power and more money, that's what they did. And God is saying tonight, what are you going to do? On my altar to counteract the power they now have. Your five minutes of prayer, your five dollar offering, he's going to deal with the kind of power these guys are working in? You are a joke. Am I talking to anybody? Okay, listen. I was going to go through the 12 laws, but I've touched a couple of them. It went differently. But in my book, it's there in Idol's Riot. But I want to go in. I want to do an activation. I want to take you into the code of heaven. I want to deal with the altars. Okay. I want to, uh, uh, um, come on, somebody. Parabasata. Do you know, uh, have you noticed the rapid rise in America of the, of the phenomenon, write it down, n in the music industry and in, bo in sports industry known as the alter ego? They are telling you what it is. It's, called, it's, it's spelled A-L-T-E-R, then E-G-O. Let me explain what an alter ego is. So you understand that everybody who's becoming famous is doing it through an altar. How are you going to become powerful against people who are using altars when you have none? Or oh, yours is weak. Yours is mambi pambi. Yours is depressed and has, has been neglected. You know the sin of Israel? The, the, the constant sin of Israel? When Israel began to walk to God, the first place you saw that Israel was walking away to, from, from God to the idols is the neglecting of the altar of the Lord. Every time. And the return of Israel every time to the Lord from the idols was the repairing of the altar of the Lord. Always and in every place. But if anything, Israel would be giving God lip service while they are running to idols. That's why God is never moved by what your mouth is saying. Because he's too busy looking at what the altar is saying. The altar says she hasn't been on her knees on that altar for seven days. Or she hasn't been there for five months. Or she hasn't been fasted for the past three years, not even one day. But every restaurant in town knows our name, knows his name. He is eating at the feast. I mean, he is feeding that belly, the God of the belly, whatever. He has not. Uh, see, God is the altars. One of the laws of an altar, which is one of the 12 laws, is all altars they speak. What is your altar speaking? Altar is it? What is it speaking? If there's an altar, this is why it's easy for me to know how to, dag to diagonize and, de and deliver people from altars. Come on, somebody. Because altars also speak through the ritual. Because all altars are places of ritual. Say it with me. All altars are places of what? Ritual. Say it with me. Do you know what a ritual is? It's a perpetual activity. And over, say with me, over and over and over again. Have you ever found yourself in a moment of candor when you're really honest and all the covers are off and you just facilitate and say, I'm tired of going through this. You are just describing the altar you are fighting. If you could stop what you are saying over and over again and ask yourself, what are you keep going through over and over again, over again, whatever that is, that's the name of the altar. Because altars cannot hide themselves because you always find them in the ritual. You can't hide evil and righteous altars. They always expose themselves through ritual. That's why David says, your praises shall continually be on my mouth. Because they're an altar of praise. <laughs> he couldn't hide it. When the ark came in the covenant, he was like this. I mean, he cut out of his clothes. 
His wife, Michael, looked him through the window. He was dancing so he was dancing like, he was dancing like an African. That's how we, I mean, because he he split his thing and his legs were showing. He's like, that's African. David must have been must have been to Africa where he had some African blood in him. We go like this. Africans love losing their legs. You, you're gonna see when you go to Africa. We, we dance with our legs. When we, that's why African love we love beats. Was it? Come on, somebody. He was dancing so much in praise to God. She looked through the window. She despised him because he looked like a fool. But David already told you. And he said, when he came to the house, how can a king do that in front of the women? You, even you, they could do the the, 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 David is like, girl, listen. <laughs> that was just the beginning of the service. We're about to go back for round two. What Praise was a ritual for David. He cut an altar of praise. What's your ritual? What do you do over and over and over again? That is speaking more loudly than what you say. And that's now how I'm fighting. But here's the thing. If you find the ritual, you find the altar, but you also find the idol. <laughs> the ritual, the idol feeds on the ritual and the food of the uh, the food the see the see the the the, 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 the the idol feeds on the ritual okay because whatever happens again and again is what the idol feeds on to gain more power if you find the food of the idol you know the name of the idol so if over and over again is you saying I'm sorry God I want you to watch pornography again but then you're back at it you just found the altar and the idol in one stop. The altar is an altar of pornography. The idol is an order, idol of sexual perversion. You found both of them. They are always inseparable. That's why we call it idols riot. And we deal with both altars and idols. God gave us the elevation on idols. He gave me the elevation on altars. We didn't even know. We met one time to do TV. We started comparing notes. And we were like, what is this? And, we, and God performed a marriage of ministry right there and she realized I couldn't teach idols without altars and you can't teach altars without idols and then we got idols riot. The combination of these two technologies because if they're, if they're inseparable, if we take one circle out, you leave the other one out, you're still in trouble because an altar if you take an idol out of an altar, this, that's, this is why now I understand why deliverance didn't work, work for much. Deliverance is casting the idol. Get out! The problem is, if the altar remains, the spirit will go. Now I understand what I never understood. When Jesus said, when a spirit comes out of a man, it goes in dry places, seeking. When it finds no rest, it goes back to the same house. Why? That's where the last altar was. It wants to investigate. If this person is really delivered, when I go back to that house, the altar I used to live from should be destroyed. If it's still there, oh, they still need me. There's a part of their soul that still needs what I do. So the spirit comes back and says, oh, the altar is still there. So this person must, en must enjoy a little bit of what I do. For let's be honest, there are sins we enjoy. We just don't like the inconvenience of the whole package, but part of the package is sweet. So the demon comes back and says, look at that, the altar. My house is still there. The exchange is still there, which means this person at a psychological level still wants to do an exchange with what I do. Now he goes back and takes seven other spirits of the same kind. And they man that altar. And they say the last condition or the last exchanges of that man, Jesus said, will be worse than the first. We are saying in these services, we are dealing with the idol and then we take a sledgehammer in the court of heaven. And people are getting delivered. People are getting set free from years of stuff they have been trying to get out of. Are you catching what I'm saying? 
So we're about to do that with you today. But I'm telling you tonight, it's going to be a powerful miracle, signs and wonder service. Amen. What I'm going about to do is I'm breaking, we are beginning, see we are breaking the fallow ground. You know what I mean, the fallow ground? Every time we are, we are digging through the soil of your heart. And uh, because these things have roots. But the more you deal, you, bl- you dig. I'm from Africa. I, I own a farm. My wife and I, we own a very big farm in Africa. We know what our workers do. They, before they do anything, they plow the ground before they do planting. We are plowing the ground. We know what is happening. Things that are rooted inside of you are being turned upside. So by the time you get to healing tonight, you'll be healed like this. Because the root system of the diseases and the afflictions has been removed by every session you've been in. Okay? But I want to take you in the court of heaven. Amen? And deal with the issue of altars in your, in your life. Can we do that? I want you to stand up right now. Praise God. Amen? Yes, please. Oh, yes. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> so I want everybody to stand. <clears throat> but I want you guys to put Psalm 96. Jessica, put Psalm 96. <clears throat> Thank you. Beginning from verse 3. We're going to read it together all the way to verse 8 so we have context. Context, it was a context, is very important. Say with me, context is always important. Okay? So Psalm 96, we're going to begin from verse 3. Amen? And we're going to read it together. And even for those who are online, Jessica, I hope they are seeing this scripture or people online. Those who are online, let me tell you something. Light moves at the speed of 186,000. Is that right? Miles per second? Okay. That's a lot of light coming your way online. And the goodness we're getting people getting healed. Me and Katie have done a lot of things where we got people getting healed on our live streams when we do our live streams. So we know the miracles that can happen on streaming. From around the world, today you need to receive this. Because let me tell you something. You are the deliverer you have been looking for. You are the deliverer you have been looking for. Hello, Moses. Come on, somebody. You know, the Bible says Moses thought there would be somebody who would look after his people because what he was looking for, he was it. You are it. You are, you are the, you, you can make the choice this weekend to be the MVP of your family. Or you can be an average player and see your family fight devils you could have destroyed by your dedication to God. Are you catching what I'm saying? But I can sense a hunger here. I can sense a commitment to God. That is so beautiful that I'm sensing that they need to build an altar. So you can bring your peace offering. So there be peace between us. Then I'll return to you. And David runs. And while he's going there, you think the angels stop killing people? No, God doesn't care. Until the Lord is made, he's just killing people. Just killing people. David is running. By the time David finally fixes the issue, 70,000 people have died because the angel would have continued because actually the Bible says he got close to David. Could have killed David too because he got close to him. <laughs> David, the Bible says, and David could see the angel killing people coming towards him, which means that David not done it by the time if the angel got to him, he would have been killed too. He gets to Aranua and he builds an altar at the same place. He builds an altar. He buys, he goes to Aranua. Aranua is just overwhelmed, happy, joyful, that the king is on my property. President. I don't care what you think. They could be stupid men. The president shows up on your house. <laughs> you forget that you're stupid. He's come up. The president is in my backyard. They have got power. God gave them power in that office. This is the king. He shows up. Aranua is so overwhelmed to have David there. He wants to give the altar for free. He says, you don't even have to pay. Oh, look, look, listen to this. You don't have to pay. You don't have to pay. What is it? It's a spirit. In in it's a spirit that has jumped in has jumped into the emotions of Aranwa. 
It's not Aranua really speaking. A spirit has jumped in Aranua, and what is a spirit? It's sending us a message. You don't have to sacrifice to God. It doesn't have to cost you anything to make things right with God. You don't have to pay. You can build the altar. And he said, for nothing. And David says, what? You don't understand. Aranua, I cannot give to the Lord that which costs me nothing. You don't get it. I have already given the Lord to an idol and he has cost me 70,000 of my people. I'm not going back to the true and living God and give him a pentas, a pinnacle. I, I need to give them an offering on the altar that shows him I love him more than the idols. That's a peace offering. And David brought, paid thousands. For, he paid thousands, the highest price he could pay for the land to build an altar. And the Bible says when he built the altar, he built the altar, the angel stopped killing people because the altar began to speak from the offering that David has repented and the Bible says that the angel stopped and he went back to heaven. But 70,000 people were dead. What am I trying to say today? We're about to come into the court of heaven. But even as we do, there's something you need to do for the Lord today. You need to give to the Lord a sacrificial offering to close the gates of devils in your bloodline that have cost you thousands of dollars and headaches in your family. So I want you right now to take a seat for a few seconds. There's an offering envelope. Get it. Because remember, he says, come to the Lord and bring an offering. Because when we go in the court of heaven, I want your offering waved in the court as a testimony that you are saying, God, I want, I'm bringing you my peace offering for the gates of the gates to the devil. That my bloodline opened up that I, we are now fighting. My, this, is, this is it. Ask the Lord what that is going to be as you come before the Lord. Ask the Lord what that is going to be. I'm not going to tell you what it is. The Lord is speaking. He's speaking. Just remember what David says. I will not give to the Lord that which costs me nothing. I will not give to the Lord that which costs me nothing. The offering envelopes are right there. You can fill out or on the screen. You can, there are different ways to give digitally. But if you give digitally, you need to write in, in your memo. Peace offering Alabama. So we know. Peace offering Alabama. Those who are online... When you give into this offering before we go in the court of heaven to close the gates of altars, evil altars that your ancestors or even you, through your lack of knowledge, open to the demonic world. You are going to write on the offering, in the memo on the offering, peace offering, Alabama. Peace offering, Alabama. What does that mean? It means we don't, we, we don't get to decide what God says just lower it. Just lower it. I love the frequency. Just lower it. We don't get to decide what God says. We just get to preach it. And by the Spirit of God, interpret it. You have no idea how, how the enemy is squirming and screaming right now in the, in, the, in the realm of the Spirit because we're about to go in the court of heaven and you have done exactly as God requested. The way you walk away from the idols is exactly what we've just done. Bring to the Lord. Give to the Lord the glory to His name that you robbed Him of when He went after the idols. How? Bring an offering, a peace offering to the Lord your God. And let the idols watch you do it. Because they know you're returning back to God and you're leaving them behind. That's how you give God the glory. We've done it. Now we can come. Then he says, now come. after you do that, when you bring an offering, look at the sequence. Then come in the court. So what I want to do is praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. But brother that, that, that saw the healing, what's your name from, uh, the, you came and testified, is it? Yes. Right now, on, on your right, there is a black bag. That's my black bag. Open the first pocket. Run on right there by, yeah, yeah. Open, yeah. Is that, it's a, it's a suit bag, right? It's a, it's a, yes. Open, yes. Open the first pocket. Just the first one. You're going to find a gavel. The, just the first pocket, smaller pocket on the front, there is a gavel. 
and the thing, and the priest that goes with the gavel, bring them here. Because God said once we're going to, it says once we make, amen, we're going to seal the judgment of the altars with the gavel. A judge's gavel. They're about to come before the court of heaven. And we're about to ask the Lord. When you hear the, when I hit the gavel, I want you to go into a Tehillah praise, to scream and shout to the Lord like the children of Israel did when the Jericho was kind of come tumbling down because when the gavel of a judge sounds in the court of heaven, it means the decision or the verdict is final. No more arguments is final. Okay? So we are going to do this together, but first let's go and do, do this issue. Are you ready? Are you ready? Okay. Just say, Heavenly Father, righteous judge, the ancient of days, I'm asking for the court of heaven the ancient of days court to be seated according to Daniel chapter 7 verse 9 and 10 Heavenly Father as you take your, your, your judicial seat I thank you for the privilege of coming into the court by the blood of Jesus Christ of Nazareth Heavenly Father as I come before you, I'm asking for the books to be opened. And all the books of my destiny, or the destinies of the members of my family who are now being afflicted, including me, by the evil altars of my father's bloodline. I'm asking that their books be opened so that these evil altars could be judged, O oh God, concerning the books. For they, are, for they are in violation of what you wrote in our books of destiny. Concerning the life we are living now. And what the idols and the authors have been doing in our life. Lord, I'm also asking that the court would also compel Satan. To open all his books concerning every altar that he, that he ever planted, built in my bloodline. The name of the altar must be revealed. The agreements of the altars must be revealed and made plain before this court. Because I'm asking God that the verdict you give me today would be a judgment concerning every book of altars Satan has on his record. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, righteous judge, I'm asking that the holy angels who are officers of the court of heaven would be witnesses to this prosecution I bring before you. To this lawsuit I bring before you of the evil altars of my father's bloodline. Even evil altars that I built in my soul. I'm asking them to also be summoned into this court to face prosecution for everything the idols and the altars thereof. I've ransacked in my life and in the life of my family members. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Heavenly Father, it is written in Matthew 5.25 that on your way to court, agree with your adversary. Lest your adversary deliver you to the judge. And the judge delivers you to the jailer. Heavenly Father, I choose to agree with the adversary's accusations that have been declared legitimate in this court. 
every accusation concerning iniquity, transgression, sin, that me and my forefathers are guilty of, I come into agreement with those accusations. Lord, I know I'm under oath, and therefore I cannot lie to this court. Me and my forefathers are guilty as charged of building altars to idols, food idols, sexual idols, mental idols, pride idols, and every other kind of idol that we build an altar to. Heavenly Father, I am asking as I activate the law of repentance, which says in 1 John 1 verse 9, it says, if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I repent. I confess my sin and the sin of my forefathers of going after idols, which are not gods, but demon spirits hiding behind objects. I repent for worshiping demons that my family is guilty of and that I am guilty of. I repent for erecting altars, platforms of exchange for these idols and evil altars. Cleanse me by the blood of Jesus as you promised that if I confess my sin, you forgive my sin. Now cleanse me and my bloodline of all unrighteousness connected to evil altars and idols thereof. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, righteous judge, I am asking for this court to hold every evil altar and idol liable for all the ransacking in health, in finances, in time, in, in lost opportunities that they have caused me and my bloodline. I'm asking this court to hold them liable. I am asking that punitive damages, punitive damages be issued against them. Lord, you are the only one who can put a monetary value and a time value to what I'm, I am now owed for all the ransacking that has taken place. Lord, I'm asking that the court would use this time to activate the offering I gave last night. The 111 offering. The Deuteronomy 111 offering. I bring it into the court. I'm asking the court to consider that offering as you exact punitive damages on these idols and evil altars concerning my life. That that which I've lost in time, in finances, in health, would be restored to me and my bloodline immediately in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, I am asking, I am asking that, the, that, that, that your court would issue on my behalf right now a bond of healing concerning any disease that I'm carrying in my body that is connected to an exchange with an evil altar and the idols thereof. Any disease whether it be generational or situational, that is connected to an exchange between me, my bloodline, and the idols, and the authors they work from, I'm asking this court, since I've now been forgiven by the blood of Jesus, to issue a bond of healing that will be attached to my body 
So I can say, I am healed. By your stripes, I am healed. This is my day of healing. Lord, as I come back for the healing service even tonight, I'm coming expecting massive healings in my life and for everybody in my family that I'm going to bring here or friends that I'm going to bring here in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, Heavenly Father, I am asking that you now issue a divine restraining order against any demonic entity or human being who would, like, who, would, who would want to deceive me into erecting another evil altar to another idol. I'm asking a divine restraining order against such activity will now be issued in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. I now receive this righteous verdict by faith. I thank you, Lord, that the gates to the demonic world that were opened by my forefathers and myself through my wounded soul that, is now, that has now been healed by the light of Jesus Christ. I am asking that those gates, ancient gates, called the altars, that were, that, that, that were opened up to the demonic entities right into my bloodline. This day, Lord, I thank you, Lord, that those gates have been closed in Jesus' name. You are giving me a verdict of closure concerning these altars. And the idols have to live in Jesus' name. So, Lord, I thank you that right now I'm experiencing deliverance from demons. I say concerning any evil spirit, hiding in any part of my soul that was traumatized, I said to that spirit, get out. The light of Jesus burns you out of my soul as I get healed by the dynamis power of God and the light of Christ in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, that this is my deal of freedom in Jesus' name. Now, when you hear the gospel, the Lord wants you to celebrate with the, with the God of shout. The Lord says to you, the, the verdict has been granted, and today it's declared a day of healing and miracles. Yeah. Come on, give God a shout. Now listen, <laughs> listen, we're going to have a lot of massive healings tonight. But before we go on a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a on a lunch break right now, I felt as you were shouting, God said there were people when you came here, you had pain in your body and it's no longer there or it just diminished. Can you raise your hand if you had pain in your body and now check yourself right now. You had pain in your body. Come on. And then all of a sudden it just, it just left your body or it just, it's, 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 come on. Oh, it's reducing. How many, how many are feeling right now? The pain is reducing. Come on. Right, right. You, are, you are pain in your body and now it's all of a sudden. Come on, somebody. Listen to me. It's in the movie. I, I just feel there are people being healed right now. Tonight is going to be crazy, but I'm telling you there are people right now. Who else? You had pain in your body. Now you're checking yourself. You just found that it's gone. Right there at the back. What's, what's happening? C can you just speak to us loudly? I wanna, I wanna, come on. Come, come here, baby. Amen. Come on, somebody. Amen. You come here again. You come in. You, you, sis, come here too. Very quickly. So, 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 who, else? who else? You had pain in your body. You just check, check yourself right. And it's just gone. I'm telling you. Uh, they, see, there are, are diseases that are connected to the altars, and some of them are tonight we're going to do with a lot of tumors. There'll be a lot of tumor hearings. If you have a, if you have a tumor, a growth in your body, tonight is going to be amazing. Now, if you, had, you had pain and it left you? You had pain? Come here, sis, very quickly. I don't want to go into a healing thing because we're going to go for lunch, but let's just get a, a couple of testimonies. What happened? Come, just come, come here. You start. What happened? Um, I had pain in my right leg um, this morning. When I was coming, I was kind of limping. And the whole time I was sitting behind the desk, I was twisting my leg. Uh, but as we prayed, I checked myself and 
I'm feeling much better now. I can really kick the leg. Come on. Praise Come on. God. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. What happened? Uh, I've been having a lot of knee pain lately. And I was actually sitting between a sister in law and a friend of ours. And out of nowhere, like my knees just gave in on me. And the pain stopped it. The pain is not there. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. The pain is not there. Come on, what happened? My neck, I have bulging disc, and so I constantly have neck pain. And when you said check yourself up, I just went like this, and it just sounded like a firecracker. It just went all the way up. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, what happened? So I, have a lot of, I have a lot of different things going on, but specifically this morning, just like a lot of burning in my throat. Burning and hurting your throat. real bad, and it's, it's going away. Away. Yes, it's so much better. Wow. And my hip has been hurting kind of all morning. I've been trying to be around, and it, it's gone away. It's the hip also, it's gone away. Listen, come on, come on, love you. Oh, listen, saints, we're going to go for lunch. We want to eat and be back here at 2 o'clock. Amen? What time is it now? 20 till 1. Amen? So, listen, we can eat in 1 hour, 20 minutes, okay? But by the way, Let's eat. I mean, let's go and eat. But let's just stand up. Let's pray over the food. Uh, whatever you're going to go, I'm gonna just going to bless the food. Amen. But remember, tonight is going to be a massive what? Healing service. We are, everything we're doing was to build to the healing service. But we want to be here this afternoon. And you're going to hear me and Carrie really talk from my heart. Why this message? Why now? Why two ministries that could be doing our own thing with massive schedules decided to reroute even around our life to do what Jesus wants to do with this? You are, you, you are, it's going to be powerful. That's at 2 o'clock. But right now, we want to pray over the food. Amen. But first, we bless the offering. Thank you, Father, for everybody who was given online and here. Thank you that the peace offering has been accepted by you, Lord. Let there be massive miracles in so many ways. Now, Father, we pray for the food. Hey, whatever they go, whether it's restaurant, we, whatever it is, Lord, we dedicate that food to you, Lord, that you bring nourishment to them, Father. And Lord, let it happen. Make, make it so that, you know, we'll be able to come back at 2 o'clock and be full and be full of...